Well, hello and welcome back to the Andrew Eborn Show, where I am delighted that my special guest is none other than one of the most prolific rock and roll stars of the last half century, the fabulous Susie Quattro. How are you doing, Susie? I'm doing great, thank you. Yep. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a happy bunny. I'm a happy bunny. Oh, good. What's made you so happy? The reaction to the single and the video. I mean, when people go nuts, so and you think, I put all that in. And I'm getting it all back. Is, is that great? Is that great? Yeah. It's so rewarding. The Devil in Me. I love the single. We're going to talk about that. Well, last time we saw you was just before Christmas. Um, you'd recovered from uh, COVID. Um, yeah. terrible experience that, which you got on the, the 8th of November. Reiner, I think, was about to go and have an eye operation. How did that go? That went fine. Then he found out after that that he had a little bit of skin cancer here, so they took that out. So we've had a wonderful time of it. He's coming over, hopefully, on the 28th to the 6th of March, because it's his birthday on the 3rd. So it's easier right now for him to get here than for anybody living here to get over there. So, But then, but then as soon as I can travel, I'm over there. But I've had my injection, so hey. uh, yeah, all going good. Uh, so it all went well, but he didn't make it over for Christmas. He did. Oh, he did? Oh, yeah, and I, I kept saying, because, you know, my wonderful Christmas song, My Heart and Soul, I Need You Over Christmas, and I'm doing all the interviews, and I kept saying to everybody, I hope that I haven't, you know, predicted something here, you know, that he's not going to be on. I have to play the song for my company. But he got here for two weeks. Oh, okay. And at the last minute, three flights were canceled, and he finally found one into Heathrow. They sent an empty plane over from the U.K. Right. to Hamburg to get about 20 people to fly them in. Oh, so nuts. Yeah. He's celebrating in style. And was one of the Christmas presents, did he give you another pair of glasses? That's <laughs> Everybody keeps talking about it because every time I do a Zoom, you see them, you know. But there are 750 here. And I've just been corrected by my husband on the phone. I thought they went back to the 20s, but they only go back to the 40s. Oh, so, well, I was going to say, because last time we spoke, because obviously um, the Ray-Bans only started in 1936. That would, that would have been your very first pair. Yes. Which is good. So, um, well, my but, collection starts from the 40s, so. Okay. But it's great all the way up, you know, fantastic, yeah. Well, what, what I love, Susie, is your routine every day, where you'll work out what outfit you've got on, uh, and then you'll pick the glasses to go with it. So we, we should start. I'll show you. What, what Hang you on. Today? Show, Let's have a look. I'll show you. Hang on. on. Oh, wrong. That's wrong. Hang on. <laughs> here I come. Here I come. Oh, okay. Oh, this is what I love. It's always these glorious moments when we go off screen. And it, it is, it's a different pair. I love it. And the great thing about this, <laughs> I can see myself. I should get mine on as well. How, how do these go? <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> it's like a I like the look that goes with it. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's good. It's good. They're not Ray Ban. Those, those are sort of Gucci, but we love that sort of stuff. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, as you come back, one of the interesting things, and you've, you've mentioned this in all the interviews, they always talk about the new specs appeal because your, your, your spectacles are everywhere. Um, but nobody's yet picked up on the fact and the connection with your family and your grandfather of Italian descent yeah. who came over nobody but nobody's picked it up so this is an andrew Eborn show exclusive because your father's name before it got shortened to quattro was that one my my grandfather's name was michael quattrochi maybe michael quattrochi it means four eyes and um like what happened to a lot of immigrants coming into america he's about nine i think when he came over they just took one look at his name and they went chop and so he entered america as michael quattro so, so that was the original family name. My mother, of course, was Hungarian. Or her name was Zanesloy, Ilona Otila Zanesloy. What a mouthful, eh? And my, yeah, so that was the original. So I'm half Italian, half Hungarian. That's fantastic. And, but that sort of diversity has sort of shared itself through lots of your sort of side. But I, I love the fact that your, your grandfather was saying it was to four eyes or bespectacled, and you've now got almost 800 pairs of the thing. So I think that's good. <laughs> four eyes, yeah. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> but it was your father. And he talked like that, you know. He he never he never lost his accent. He was in the, in America talking like that. And we say, Grandpa, we can't understand you. What do you say? I'm not talking like that. Or why you say, Susanna? Why don't you shut up? You know. <laughs> Extraordinary. But he came over. He was very young when he came over. He was nine years old, as you say. What brought him over? 
I think they had some relatives who had already come over, some older brothers had come over. And so his family, you know, like a lot of families in Europe did at that time, go to the Golden Dream of America, da 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 da. And uh, he never saw his, my dad alive again. Yeah, that's pretty sad. But he made it, you know, he, he ended up, um, what a man, what a, he's my favorite relative. He um, eventually married very young and he went into the coal mining, first of all. And he said he used to have my dad strapped on the back and him and my grandma would walk to the next mining job. You can't imagine it, can you? You can't imagine it. They ended up in Detroit, work factory. So, as you do. As you do. And I guess that whole sort of work ethic, because uh, from from your father, uh, Art, I mean, he was he worked incredibly hard, didn't he? He was an engineer at General Motors and would get up really early, five o'clock uh, in the morning, finish at midnight. Is that where, I mean, you're, you got your own work ethic from your father, didn't you? I think I got my, my work ethic and my professionalism from my dad ingrained in me. It's an Every, in my body when he saw that i was really serious like when i joined the band and he saw i was going that way and he, he took me aside and he, he he said something to me that i've lived by my entire career he said one thing i want to tell you he said uh when you go on that stage it doesn't matter if there's 10 people to ten thousand. every single person has took money out of their pocket and paid to see you and you owe them it. I'm still like that today. Yeah. If if I see one person, it could be 10,000. If I see one person not smiling, I'll find him. <laughs> so I, I give everything. My father taught me that. He said, if you don't go up there and give everything you've got, then you shouldn't be up there at all. It's your job to entertain, to give a piece of your soul. So that's what I do. Yeah, and, and it, it was a big musical family as well. You say you get your work ethic from your father, uh, but your heart from your mother. And she was an extraordinary woman. I mean, five children of her own. She sadly had three miscarriages, and but also it didn't stop there. She then would take on adopted children as well, about nine of those as well. An incredible woman. She was a mother, 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 mother. That's all I can see. You'd uh, maybe drop your clothes for the day on a couple hours later, it was full chair. You could eat off the kitchen floor. Her whole life was work, work, work. But she was a, oh, she's my heart. She, I just loved my mom. The whole song, The Devil in Me, is, is stuff she said to me, yeah. you know. She always said to me, you're an angel, Susan, until your halo slips and it becomes a noose. And I thought, that's a good luck. <laughs> Unfortunately, it slips a lot, you know. But no, she was, um, she was a very, very good Catholic woman. She gave me certainly the tracks to run on for the rest of my life. Even, you know, none of us are angels. Even if you go a little bit this way, you know, you know the tracks. And everybody that knew her, including ex-boyfriends, ex-husbands, friends of mine from way back when, friends now, even Mickey Mouse Widow, they all talk about her in these, you've never seen anything like, oh, your mother, oh, your mother. And one time, Mickey Mouse Widow, we were out for dinner. And I said, Chris, you're always talking about how wonderful my mother is. Can you tell me why? Right. And she sat quiet for a minute. And she went, she was the most decent woman I ever met. Oh, that teared me up a little bit. That, that she was decent, decent. Yeah, and not many people like that, you know? And it, it, it grounds you, doesn't it? I mean, people talk about um, your sort of attitude to life and they, they always say, it's Socrates, wasn't it? Nothing, nothing goes wrong with a bit of Socrates. Give me a child until the age of seven and I'll show you the man or the adults. I mean, that, you work on that sort of basis. And your upbringing, you were the fourth of five children. And as the fourth, I, I have four of us, basically. I have three siblings and I know I'm number three in it. I know you have to fight, don't you? You have to fight for your voice to be heard. Absolutely. And I sure made up for it now, didn't I? Um, but, but I knew, I knew very young, very young, I was a square peg in a round hole. I knew it. I loved my family, you know, don't get me wrong, we're all really close and everything, but I just didn't fit in. I was just different. I couldn't tell you how I was different. I was just different. And I needed to find my voice. Yes, absolutely. I, I didn't like to be one, just one of the kids. No, not enough for me. 
I need it to be Susie. Yeah. And that's why I am so uncompromising with me, with anybody. I'll, I'll give anybody anything, you know, I'm talking your problems over with you, I'll give you my heart and my soul, but don't compromise me. Yeah. No, well, ain't going to happen. And it certainly runs through, I mean, runs through lots of your lyrics and things like that. You say, look, nobody's going to get my soul. This is, uh, and even the advice that you give to people when you uh, received your doctorate from uh, the University of Cambridge, the Anglia Raskin was, you know, there's that little light in, you've got to search for that little light and, and make sure you switch that on. If that's your search. I, I love, because that, that defines, and I've listened to so many different interviews where it's, that's what's come through. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it's, it's how I feel. I, I, when I went up to make that speech and I had my paper there because you know, I'm in front of all the academics, didn't even graduate, um, and I just put my speech over there and I just spoke. Yeah. And what, what I said, the important thing besides going in and finding your light is once you find it, don't let anybody switch it off. That's the important part. And, and you always say that as well when you're talking about relationships and uh, and you've had like most people it's a roller coaster of emotion like that's that's your life i think that, that's fair to say but you've been together with with um reina for i mean several years uh, for the anniversary was the last time you saw him before christmas um but you you live separately as well though <laughs> munich and, and and essex is that a secret to a good marriage well i had i had the 24 7 with my ex you know we we worked together and and live together in the same house. This one, I took, little, I took a little while to get used to that. And then once I did, it's marvelous. Not during the pandemic, because before the pandemic, we had a choice. I'm gonna come there now for a couple of you come here and now it's like we can't, so that's different. But it's been 27 years, it's worked. He, he's the one that doesn't like it now. I love it. He's completely changed. Wow. It was but, me that didn't... Because normally what would happen, Susie, is that you would go on tour. He was obviously uh, his promoter, very famous promoter, does that sort of stuff. And you'd be on tour together. So even though you'd be in Essex and he'll be in, in, in Munich and you'll, you'll, you'll do that sort of stuff, you might get together every now and again. Um, what happens is that when you're on tour, you're together and it's those glorious moments. That must have been really difficult for the last uh, several months. It, oh, really hard because uh, we we're not seeing each other hardly at all. Five months last year and two months now. So, but that, that touring together only started after he finished his own promoting business. He's a promoter. So once he stopped putting out his own shows, then he more concentrated on me and he started to come with me, but before he didn't, but it still worked. You know, we'd go a week apart, two weeks apart, maximum. And then either I go there, he comes here. But, um, but now it's, it's a forced situation and we both hate it. Thank God for Skype. Oh, oh, absolutely. And that creativity. And thank God for having a studio at home where you work with your son, Richard. And uh, that was lucky. Brilliant. I mean, brilliant stuff because you haven't stopped being creative and you're entertaining. We talk about being a child to the age of seven. Well, you actually wrote, you weren't sure what sort of side of the profession you're going to get into, whether it's going to be singing or a comedian at one stage. And you wrote to Red, of all people, Red, Red Skelton. Tell us about that. <laughs> It still makes me laugh. I did my one woman show on Zipped on stage and I told the story because it's so funny. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to acting, comedian, anything. I wanted to entertain. And I wrote, to, I was about seven or eight, and I wrote to Red Skelton, a big famous American comedian. And I said, Dear Red, <laughs> Dear Red, not even Mr. Skelton, Dear Red, um, I'm very funny. And I think you should hire me for your show. Love Susie Quattro. And he never wrote back. I was, yeah, my first rejection. <laughs> no red letter day for you. What a shame. Outrageous. You know, <laughs> at least he could have written back. do that. I know it's just, just crazy. But it didn't, put you off. didn't put you off because um, yeah. at an early age, you were, you were piano, you did percussion as well. Uh, but you set your, your sight very high because you wanted to have, you wanted to play the bongos, didn't you? It was on a wish list. And um, I think you discovered one Christmas. You were searching for what you assumed was your Christmas present. Tell us about that. <laughs> Good story. Um, I had asked my dad for some bongo drums and because uh, I wanted to be a beatnik and read poetry and uh, do all that. See, I told you I was always strange, just unusual. Yeah. And... Um, about a week before Christmas, I started to search for Christmas presents, like you do. And uh, I went into his closet and I saw a, it was beautiful. 
beautiful, brand new pair of beautiful bongo drums. And, and I am very honest. My mom always told me when I was little, don't even try to lie because your face shows everything. So I don't lie. Um, and I went up to my dad and I went, Dad, I saw my Christmas present. And he went, what, what, what? And he said, what? He said, do you mean those bongos in my closet? And I said, $200, yeah. $200 worth. Yeah. He said, do you really think I would give a $200 set of bongo drums to a little seven-year-old girl? And I went, oh. And I totally believed him. And then at Christmas, I opened up and there they were. <laughs> That's brilliant. 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 Brilliant well, way to give well, me a gift. Well, totally that. And, and it's great because a lot of parents try to dissuade their children from getting into bands. Your parents are really encouraging. In fact, you went on to perform with your father's band. Tell me about that. Well, he used to take me sometimes. My mother didn't even know it before she passed away. We, he was supposed to drop me at church. See, the seeds are sown, very young. So he would let me come on a Sunday sometimes with him to his Sunday gig. And he let me play the bongos in front of the band, his little trio, and I played Mac the Knife, and I got 25 cents. <laughs> Glorious. But it's not just 25 cents for Mac the Knife. It's the feeling of a crowd and getting that taste for being in front of an audience. How did that Absolutely. feel? Oh, it was just always so natural for me. You know, we did um, five kids, and we all play. We all play. Three or four instruments it's not a big deal we just do uh that's how we grew up and we always did family shows i would sometimes do a sketch i'd sometimes play the piano i whatever i did each person would do something sometimes we do a duet with my sister and da 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 da, da. but i noticed very very young that whenever i did my piece whatever it might be everybody went and stopped and watched so that translates in your little young brain not ego, but that you can hold an audience that goes in. And I, I always used to think, I'm good at this. Mm, I have a talent for it. You know you have something that makes people stop. And I've always had that. My dad always said that. Even as a young kid, I had the charisma. People would watch. So you, you put that in your arsenal. You know, you know you've got that, and that's what you develop. It's a natural thing. Nobody can give that to you. Nobody can teach it to you. Yeah. It's just something that comes out. I, I guess I'm watchable. Yeah. Oh, no, w without a doubt. It's that sort of spirit and that sort of well, vibe is the best way of putting it. Because as you say, it's, and you've done a lot of acting yourself, unless you've got that vibe, it's not right, is it? No, it's not right. And my dad had that here, charisma. You know, even when I went in the first band and I was 14, and we stood up on that stage the first time with my bass guitar and we knew three songs, three chords. And I remember standing up there and thinking, I'm home, I'm home. And about a year into the band being together, a year and a half, my eldest sister joined on keyboards and her husband started to manage the band. And after about a month of him managing the band, we were at a gig and he announced as we were setting up the equipment, we didn't have roadies back then, he announced to the band horrible for me really he said you all realize of course that we have to put most of the lights on susie i'm going <laughs> how to make friends and influence people i didn't ask him for that but he said it uh, well i i i do know susie as i say coming from a, a family of four that if you're the one they put the spotlight on it causes all sorts of other issues and and it's yeah. um it's going back i mean i'm going back just a little bit before that because it was the ed sullivan show i think which also acted as a sort of helpful catalyst when you first saw elvis in 1956 and i was trying to work out because you've talked about this in various other interviews was it the very first performance elvis did because he did three performances on i this think it was the, he did don't be cool i believe it was his first performance and, the, and the per, i'll tell you why because ed sullivan wasn't hosting on the first one because he'd been in an accident Oh, well, then it would have been in the second one then. Because what Charles would... Lawton did that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, and then he, so that would have been September the 9th, 19th, I think it was October the 28th, 1956. You were okay. still six years old. I'm still six, uh, yeah, six years old. Yeah, we'll we'll forgive you a couple of months. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm amazing, amazing. I was, uh, I'm, I'm never, it was a pivotal moment in my life because um, we all watched the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. Families gathered. And at the end of every show, he would put it on, as he used to say, he used to go, no, something for the youngsters. He used to do it like that. And um, 
my elder sister by nine years, so she's 14, 15, just exactly the right age, she starts to scream. Elvis comes on doing Don't Be Cool, she's screaming. And I remember looking at her and going, why are you screaming? You know, it was confusing to me. Then I turned and looked in the camera on the TV. And I, I was drawn in like hypnotized, drawn in like that, watching him. And I went in my little head, I went, I'm going to do that. That age. Yeah. It went in and it stayed. I'm going to do that. And he's been on my shoulder my entire career, my entire career. In fact, I won't bother you. There's so many of them. It's like nine or 10 epiphanies. But one of the ones that really hit me hard was when I did uh, Singing with Angels, my tribute. And I recorded it in Nashville with James Burton. And, and the Jordan Airs, come on. Give me a break. <laughs> anyway, loved it. really. And we were outside on a break from recording. And I played James about five or six of the tracks from my new album. Yeah. He had a headphones in. And he looked at me and he said, boy, oh boy, you got what Elvis had. I went, I didn't even care if he meant it. He said, <laughs> and then he said, I said, what? He said, well, the only way I can explain it is that whatever you do is you. Yeah. What a compliment. Oh, but even better than that compliment was from Elvis himself, who, as things would have it, saw your poster, heard your version, and tried to get you to come to Graceland, but you turned him down. I did. <laughs> I wasn't ready. I wasn't scared. I wasn't ready. I thought it was premature. I thought I'll meet him next year. I had like three hits. Meet him, but he called me and said, um, I've just, uh, his people called first and then he got on, you know, you could have knocked me over with a feather. And he said, I've heard your version of All Shook Up and it's the best since, I, since my own. And I'd like you to come to Graceland. And I, and I think I said something like, I'm very busy. <laughs> but you know what? I, I believe that everything happens for a reason. And I think if I would have met him, I wouldn't have written, well, I wouldn't have written Sing Him With Angels because I wouldn't have had that spiritual feel about him. Because I would have met him, it would have taken that 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 awe away. So, I'm, I I wasn't supposed to meet him. He was supposed to guide me, yeah. you know. Even the day I got um, when I went to uh, Los Angeles, my son just showed up at the window, scared me. Um, oh, oh, bring it in, bring it in, Richard. It's gonna be good. We could talk about this as well. Fantastic. He can come in and chat to us. We we love that. He can do. It'd be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, come on, <laughs> that's all waving. That's, did like, you see? Hey, this is great because you get to see. Did you see the mother look? Oh, yeah, I, I love it. Oh, yeah, he was scared that I think everybody came running there. That, that, that was directly from your because your mother was quite a disciplinarian, wasn't she? She, mm -hmm. she? she would keep you under control, which was good. Richard, I'm not. No, I'm not. What? He just wanted to just to say a few oh, words. Say hi, Richard. No, I can't. No, he, he, yeah, he, sorry. He, he's got something to do. Okay. Oh, that's okay. We'll, we'll see him another time. <laughs> see you another time. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what, what were we talking about? Was I we saying? were talking about Elvis before, before Richard. We were talking about Elvis and the influence and spirituality and how that's important for you. Yeah. Um, when I was went to uh, L.A. to audition for Happy Days and I got went in there, met everybody, read for the part, and they said to me, okay, now we need to discuss you, so go back to the hotel, we'll call you. So I went back to the hotel, switched on the television, waiting for the phone to ring, you know, like that. And um, the phone rings. And they said, well, not only do we want you for the two-party, we want you for three seasons. And I went, fantastic. And right then, the TV said, newsflash, the king is dead. Yeah. Now, you cannot write stuff like that. So he's been here the whole time. And then when I got back three months later to film the first episode, they said, here, Susie, we'd like you to meet somebody. His name is Nudie. I shook his hand. They said, he's going to be making your clothes for the series. He was Elvis's personal tailor. Now, you see, I wasn't supposed to meet him, but I've met everybody around him. I know all of his inner circle, you know, and James especially. But so there you go. Everything happens as it should. 
I know, and, and Scott, I mean, it's been a really important part of your life with your Catholic upbringing. It has, so forth, yeah. And, uh, uh, and we'll speak about some of those experiences as well. But the other big thing, again, was the Ed Sullivan show, <laughs> was when you saw in, um, that was the Beatles for the first time. Tell me about that. Yeah, we were on, they did, um, I saw her standing there. That was from the first album, Meet the Beatles, it was called in America. And again, we were all watching. Uh, and again, we uh, we all got excited, excited, excited. And we went to the phones. My sister, my elder sister, Patty, me, we called up our two friends, Nana Mary Lou Ball, and Diane on another phone. So we had all, everybody was on phones. And we were all ooey and eyeing over the Beatles. And my sister, Patty said, hey, why don't we form an all-girl band? And we all went, oh, great idea. I, I honestly didn't care about girls because I'm not a gender person, but I wanted to be in a band. That was great. And everybody picked an instrument real quick. I'm playing rhythm. I'll play piano. I'll play. And I went, hello, what am I going to play? And my sister Patty said, you're going to play bass. I said, okay. I already played percussion and piano. I, I read and write and learn, you know. Um, and I asked my dad, did he have a bass guitar? for me to borrow and he gave me for my first bass oh, i make musicians green musicians go green with envy i got given a 1957 fender precision gold scratch plate striped down the back of the neck sunburst finish the rolls royce of bass guitars my bass i didn't know there were smaller basses i had no idea my dad said here you go i said fine this is what i play can you believe that yeah uh, absolutely. And well, it's your size, it's your weight, it's, it's now above your mantelpiece, isn't it? Yes, I still have it hanging by the fireplace there. Yeah. But what a what an instrument to start on the 1957. You know, you're right, musicians would be green with envy. And not only that, playing the bass, because you, it was the revolution, if you like. People need to put it in perspective, because yes. not only were there no women playing rock and roll, and you've always, no. as you say, gender is irrelevant but to put it in context you were the first one carrying a bass playing an instrument on stage at an extraordinary time um you picked the name the pleasure seekers but that wasn't your first choice you talked about hedonist first of all yeah hedonist yeah we, we quite like that we looked it up in the dictionary somebody said hedonist we went mm. and we looked it up and it said to seek pleasure and we went boing 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 pleasure seekers we had the name yeah it was great I was Susie Soul in that band. Yeah. Love <laughs> Otis Redding and everything. Yeah. And Patty Pleasure, wasn't it? Patty Pleasure. She she later got the nickname of Gestapo. <laughs> Everybody called her that. She did she wasn't happy with that, but <laughs> No, I can imagine. It was, a, but tell me that because you you had a, a, a few records, you you went on to uh, uh, get a, a good signing as well. Um, what was life like in those days, as sort of family unit? Because being on the road can be quite stressful anyway. When that sort yeah. of sibling rivalry is there as well, and put the spotlight on Susie, how did that make you feel? Um, well, first of all, it, it was it was cocooned in a way because I had my sisters with me, and they had the husband was managing, and we became a. Um, a show band, you know, because it's cabaret my, and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we had to do shows because we were girls and we brought the customers in, and so we we did like a Motown set, a Beatles set, a this set that we did all five five shows a night, you know. And I was on the road. I was supposed to go back to school, and uh, I called my dad from New York, sitting on the hotel bed, and I and I always remember that my mom got on the extension another pivotal moment of my life. And I said, Dad, uh, I think I found what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't want to come back and finish school. There was a silence. And then he just said, Susie, is there anything I can say to change your mind? I said, no. And he quietly put the phone down. Psychologically, that's very clever. Because what what it felt like he did was he cut my lifeline. So it was a real sitting there maybe fifteen twenty minutes. I sat there, and then I went, yep, and I made up my mind. But he made gave me pause for thought, which is good, you know, because this is serious stuff. I mean, you're giving up your education. So when you paused for thought, though, did it obviously didn't change your mind? Did you think he was approving or disapproving? I think he was making me think about it. Right. Because 
like he always said, this is a profession, you know, and you have to be professional. So he was making sure it's what I really wanted. I didn't look back. I'm, I've now been in the business 57 years. Oh, no. I, absolutely. So, and, and every day, but each of these is sort of the building block for the next stage of your career. And even as you say, singing for 57 years probably helped you with COVID because I, you, those lungs running on stage, performing for two hours, all that sort of stuff. I think it did. I, I, I said that to the doctor, wondering if I sounded a bit stupid. I said, could that have anything to do with it? And he said, let's put it this way. He said, the, the COVID virus probably had a hard time grabbing, grabbing hold of your lungs. Really, that's all I've ever done. Yeah. I'm like an athlete, really, aren't I? Oh, you know, that, that base, yeah, the, yeah the, the base weighs more than I do. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a hot leather suit under the hot lights and jogging and singing and running and playing. So yeah, what a workout, yeah. two hours. Absolutely, and, and you can, well, keep on running. I mean, your, your, your mother always used to ask you, where, where, where are you running to? <laughs> she always said that she one time said to me, why don't you go chase yourself around the block? <laughs> <laughs> great phrase, I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I tried, I, I, I tried to catch myself too, but I couldn't know. Um, yeah, I've always been one of those too much energy not too much but a lot i have a lot i still have now you can see a positive thing isn't it because you as you say it's that vibe it's that sort of unreleased thing where you're like a a coiled spring so yeah that's why during these times when you're normally performing 100 concerts had to be cancelled it must have been really tough but you're getting your we almost saw richard we might get him in a bit later but you worked on that sort of base where you can turn those creative juices but working, first of all, taking you back to the pleasure seekers, you had relative success. You, you performed a lot, 45 minutes set, lots of those every night, because that's what you did in Cabaret World. And people say, oh, it's so tough doing a gig. You were doing several a night, <laughs> several for weekends. That's, that's the nature of the business. You changed your name to Cradle. Why was that? Well, we did a gig. Um, one of my, my brother turned to promoting. He's a fine musician, but he started to promote festivals way back in the early days, in late 60s. And... Um, we we played as the pleasure seekers on um, um, one of his big festivals and we had been cocooned in show business land you know we were show band so there we were doing our show band set in front of a festival crowd and for the first time ever we didn't go down very well so we had a big band meeting and we decided that we needed to change things up if and we're going to leave the clubs start doing more of these kind of shows become a heavier band write our own equipment and bring my little sister in because she was from that era and she very very good voice and let her be the lead singer for a while so I kind of stepped back and so my light they, they tried to hide my light but they big couldn't make big mistake if anybody knows anything about Susie if you yeah. know Susie like I know Susie don't try to hide Can't. that light I will not be ignored <laughs> and Mickey came to see that band I did about three or four songs a night. That's all. Nancy did the main thing. So I, I got really good at my bass in that 18 months or two years, however long it was, I became really good because I was mainly playing. Mickey came to see that band. Electra Records Mickey, your came. Brother, Mickey, your brother brought oh, Mickey Most along, didn't he? Yes, Mickey Most, yeah. yeah. And um, first of all, Electra had seen that band and they offered me a solo contract. That same week, Mickey Most came to Detroit with Jeff Beck to record at Motown. Jeff Beck and Cozy Powell. He saw the band. And he only saw me. Yeah. So you can't hide the light. Yeah. You can't hide it. And that was the difference. I mean, it is extraordinary. You say about everything coming at once. Then two offers, effectively, because Electra saw you and loved you and <laughs> wanted to make you the next Janis Joplin. So, oh, that will be the next Janis Joplin. And <laughs> your, your voice is saying it all. Mickey said, I want to make you the first Susie Quattro. You can That's be right. you. That's not a difficult decision. It's not a difficult decision. I knew Mickey was the right guy. He saw me. And the funniest part is he called his wife, which I didn't know till a few years after I got here, he called his wife after seeing me. And he said, it's kind of funny. He said, I found it. At last, I found it. And she said, what? He said, I don't know, but I found it. <laughs> he didn't know what I was. He said, unique. He said to me, I saw you. You stood out like a beacon. Didn't like the band at all. I went up and did two songs. That's all. Yeah. I did the one I wrote called Brain Confusion and Jailhouse House Rock. And I came off the stage and he went like this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very, very tempting. But before you went with him to, to London, 1970, 
won. He brought you over here. But before you went there, uh, let's go back to your spiritual side. You went and um, spoke to a clairvoyant who, and you asked her, Mrs. Beardsley, wasn't it? You asked her about- Oh my God, I wish I could find that. I lost it in my travels. I had the tablet that she wrote on because she, she's just this old grandmother lady. So you have to take her serious. You know, she's just one of the, you know, she's not anything strange. And a friend of mine said, come and see this lady. She's really good. So I went and she just goes into this little sort of trance and she just writes. And then she tells you what she's written. And she said, um, oh, she told me lots of things about my family that I didn't know. Names and stuff I wasn't aware of that my mother confirmed. Somebody's here, this one's here, this one's here. And my parents even went to her. And uh, she said to me, you're going to be going to England. And I kind of went, yeah, right. But I did. And she told me your first car was going to be a blue sports car. And it was a blue Mercedes. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I, I did have the pad. I don't know what happened to it. But even even the roses, she said, I see roses. Big success with roses. Oh, I always wondered what that was. Wow. Because the new video has roses and my face in the middle of it. I never knew. That's another one that just came true. And, and she also said about the number five. Yes. When you went back to your old house. Yes. And uh, you took a picture. Not all your sisters were there, but you took a picture. And there was an extra image in the photograph when it was developed. No, no, nobody can explain this. Nobody can explain it. Um, we went around, And now I can't find that picture. Anyway. Oh. We ran around to the back of the house because nobody was there. We knocked on the doors. They usually let us in. I had a whole bus there. It was my 60th birthday. Yeah. We went around to the back where my dad had built a little porch with a, with the grass in that we could sleep in the summer. And we took a picture of all of us against the window. And when my sister developed the picture, there was my mother's image to the side with her earrings on. And I just went, What? How, how did that happen? How did that happen? I mean, I've shown it to a lot of people. I've shown it to people not told them anything. I showed it to my nephew. I said, what do you see here? And he went, oh, there's grandma. Crazy, how does that happen? Wow. It's, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And you've had some, I mean, you say that the place you have in Essex is haunted. You've got a few ghosts there. And uh, we mentioned Janis Joplin beforehand, uh, a particularly scary, episode when yes i won't do that again went to a seance and tried to contact janice yeah, we, 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 were, we were bored and being silly and it got serious and we shouldn't have done it i won't do that again you don't play with these things but we were all sitting around you know on the ground and being stupid and bored and oh let's call somebody let's call janice and you could the whole atmosphere in the room changed i didn't like it one somebody was holding a bible i don't know why and just as you could feel something, and I didn't think it was Janice, it felt like something not good coming into the room, Patty was at the door and she banged on it, right? And somebody went, ah, and threw the book up in the air, the Bible up in the air, switched the lights on, somebody said, I can't see, I was crazy. And a page got ripped out of the Bible as the book was thrown in the air and it said, thou shalt not tamper with the unknown. And I said to Patty, why did you come here? She said, I don't know. I was sitting in my room and I heard voices going by the room. And so I thought I better come get you guys. So she came down just as you could feel something happening and she banged on that door. So no, I won't be doing that again. It was just a silly thing. You know, you, everybody does stuff like that. You know, oh, let's try to do this and that. I didn't realize how serious it is. I won't do that again. No, but you were genuinely frightened, weren't you? You were genuinely frightened, a very frightening moment. Yes. very. very I, I was wondering if we could do that, because I'm quite psychic myself anyway, so I wondered if we could get her to come in, you know? But I think what that does is it draws in, you get a lot of uh, malevolent, maybe that's a heavy word, mischievous energies. You know, so good and bad. There's yin and yang. That there has to be for everybody. Good. There's got to be bad. So luckily, yeah. everything in this house is 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 friendly. I've never been frightened yeah. here. Devil in me. There are those dark moments. You you have all of those, and it's recognizing that. You say you're, you and you've mentioned this beforehand that you say that you're you're psychic. How does that manifest itself? Um, I've got 
very, very, very strong intuition. I can read people within five seconds. I've already read well, you. So tell me about me. I, I see it all the, the whole time you've been talking. There's a very, there's a very, very wounded warrior in you. You've been hurt. And you've been able to almost successfully bury it, but it's in your eyes. So I think a little heartache has come your way. And the uh, see, this comes to me. You shouldn't, you should, you've now learned the lesson that you had to learn. You've learned it. And I know you haven't thrown it away yet because that pain of that is very familiar and comfortable to you, you know? Oh yeah, I know how that, you're there. It's just there. It's almost like a comfort to hold on to it, but it's now time to let it go. You've learned the lesson. Boom. Okay. Did I get it right? I, I think that's good advice for everybody. Is that, would that apply to your own life as well? Do you think? Yes, but in a different way. What would, in what a different would be different? Way. I, I, I tend to, um, I'm very sensitive. Yeah. Uh, You're a Gemini, so we have a, a, lots of things in common with all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very sensitive. Um, but you did have a heartache. I know it. I see it. Okay. Um, one particular one. Broke your heart. You nearly never recovered. Okay. And I see it. It's all here. When you read people, it's all here. Um, I tend to use, I, I found a way to use my sad moments and make them positive moments by turning them into songs or poems so i use them uh it's hard for me for me to let go of the childhood things you know the the resentment of my sister patty that's hard for me to let that go because it's still there um it's and you need this you need a lot of it to keep going you should never forget but sometimes you have to let it go. I always say emotions, you can't control your emotions. Nobody can. That's why they're emotions. But what you can do is change how you react, how you react to your emotions, if that makes sense. You can look at it and say, okay, this makes me feel like this. Okay. I understand why. It, you know, like you can analyze it, but I'm, I'm just one of the most sensitive people you ever met in your life. It's ridiculous. But, just but, it's, but it's great, and as you say, and, and all of your rich, rich catalogue of songs, you write from the heart, you write from experiences. This is what you've done. You've had a relationship that hasn't worked, that comes out in a song. You have a macho guy, you're, you're right about that, but you also work out that there's a, a soft side and there's a dark secret, or there's something needing help within all of that sort of side. And these are about individuals. You won't always say who they are. It could be more than one, but you will. it will come out in your work. Is that a fair comment? Absolutely correct. I rarely, I don't think I've ever written fiction. I always have to go to me and find my, my experience of whatever I'm writing about. You know, I'm working on one today. Oh. And when, when the lyrics come, it's, it's like, oh, I get excited. Oh. And then it's there, and I put it down, and I go, oh. Yeah. Is, is that, I mean, we, we, we come on to the process, but uh, but you normally say that you will start with a title. And then I often do. Is that right? often, yeah. often with a title. Every now and again, it's maybe just a line, but very often it will be a title, and the title will suggest the mood of the song. It will suggest which instrument I should write it on. You know, it's, it's all about the vibe. It's all about getting the vibe. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the devil in me, Funny one about that. I said it about six months ago. I said, well, the angels guard the devil in me. And my son said, mom, that's the title of the next album. I said, that is. So I wrote some lyrics and I kept trying to start a song with these lyrics and nothing was coming. Nothing was coming. So I went, okay, put it back in the book. It'll find its place. So the last track on this album my son showed me this riff. He said, okay, we need one more song. What do you think of this? I said, I like that. Send it to my computer. I came in here. I got my acoustic bass, which is how I work. I play along. Uh, and I got my songbook out, flicking through, trying to find either a title or a line that went, bam, this belongs here, right? And the lyrics for The Devil and Me 
fell out of my book and landed in front of me. As if my mother, because a lot of this, it's about her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As if she had gone, here you are, Susan, here's the words. (laughs) And I went, okay, all righty. So, you know, it was really strange how that happened. I mean, they they just, you know, I'm flicking through and I went, bump, I went. And then I started to sing these words with the song, perfect. Right. Without any problem, it just fit. So that's how that's how creation happens sometimes. It's wonderful. So it was your mother Helen. I mean, it's all over the song. It's all over the lyrics and things like that. You're absolutely right about the noose around your neck, your halo slipping. I mean, all all these uh, <laughs> <laughs> a glorious line in itself. Um, but you also touched on, and you've been very open and honest. You've done autobiographies. You've had unzipped. You've got the documentary, which is brilliant. It's going to be a feature film. You've warts and all is what you always say because you are honesty and integrity. <laughs> at your core and you mentioned about the difficulties with your siblings and as i say um similar situations we we, we can relate you you can can there's always sibling rivalry you know let's this is not some big dark secret every family has it yeah yeah it's just when it turns when it's something that's been going on the entire time it gets a little bit tedious you know so it's the one sister that the younger one we now talk fine we had it out about the documentary because they were they, they didn't talk to me for a year. Yeah, I, 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 saw, you, I saw that interview you sort of, and you were quite hurt by it. You, I mean, you were in tears. Yeah. You had your yeah. grandson watching the movie also in tears. And um, it's, it's tough, isn't it? Yeah, but why? What I couldn't understand, which I did talk to Nancy about it, is how can you agree to do an interview, which I had nothing to do with. I wasn't even in the room. Yeah. You answer you've answered the questions, you've said what you want to say, and then be mad at me. <laughs> what, what's, Go figure. Go figure. Cause, cause, really? but also the great thing, even though you had editorial control, you wanted to see the final cut, you wanted it to be warts and all, didn't you? Yes, I did. And I had editing scissors yeah. of my documentary, and I promised the director, as long as what is said is true, it's what the person thinks, even if it's a cringe moment. It stays in, and I stuck with that. Yeah. yeah, many, many times I wanted to crawl out of the cinema. Believe me, but those, those are the best moments in the film. Well, those my, moments. My regret, Susie, is that I missed it when you were just around the corner and, and by Regent's Park, and I think you had it that cinema, one of the premier. Yeah, the premier. Yeah, just around the that corner. That was the first from time I saw it with an audience, and oh my! God. On the big screen, and you see yourself, and it's all. <laughs> but I get yes. what, what I what I try to do is this when with any sort of dispute and there are lots in everybody's life as as you know it's a roller coaster of emotion you try and look at it from the other people's point of view. Sure, Mickey most I get it. Anybody would know it's not that difficult. Mickey most didn't want the band. He didn't didn't want the cradle. He wanted the bass player who he was trying to shove at the back, and yeah. he wanted to take you and only you to London. How did you break that news to your siblings, and how did they react? Well, it was, it, it's a long story. It's been going on since it happened. And there's many different versions, but I believe my brother's version because he's another Gemini and he's also very honest. And it was him that instigated it. Mickey flew him to New York the day after seeing the band, flew my brother to New York. And he told my brother, I don't want the band. I only want Susie. Now I know it's a family band, so I don't know how you're going to do this, but you know, I leave it with you. He said, I don't want to break up a family, but I only want Susie. Mickey came back and told my dad and Patty and my little sister, and nobody told me. Right. So about another six months went by of me sending Mickey tapes of the band and calling him sometimes and having a few words with them. Patty kept saying, call him. He likes you. Call him. He said, send the tapes. And finally, the band started to break up. And um, I rode my bicycle to my sister's house, my elder sister. She wasn't in the band anymore. And I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do this my whole life? And then she said, call Mickey most. I said, why? He only wanted you. I said, what? What? So they didn't tell me. That's wrong. Yeah. That's morally wrong. And karma, karma. Karma comes back, um, and and you know, like like I said, I didn't I didn't stop anybody from realizing their dreams. I just realized mine. I didn't put a brakes on anybody else. This is where I'm going, you know. So anyway, I talked with Nancy Fine. Patty's still having a problem, but I think she always will. 
we have had a few emails and, a, you know, a semi conversation and maybe it'll just ease itself down because they are my family and I do love them. Well, ab absolutely. And, and all families have rifts and, 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 and difficulties. If, if Patty's watching now and everybody watches this show, so she's bound to be watching, what would you say to her? I love you. And I'm sorry your dream didn't come true. Wow. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> there you go. But it does. It makes it makes you feel quite tearful. I think it's a, it is extraordinary. I mean, the decision was, however, made. However, um, everybody found out about it. You came in 1971 to good old England. Hurrah! We love having you here. As you've, um, even though you're always, uh, your soul is still in Detroit and always will be. You, as, as you make clear on every occasion, and I get that. Um, 1971. You arrive. You're picked up in a glorious vehicle. Tell us about that. <laughs> We were, we were met at the airport. My sister had not flew over with me. I think she stayed for about four days. And there was a guy standing there, a little mini cab, and he had a sign, Susie Quantrell. <laughs> Great, the big star. You know, <laughs> it's funny. A uh, little car, and he took us to a small bedsit in um, Earl's Court. Earl's Court, yeah, just up the road, yeah. Yeah, crappy little room. It was. Uh, and then I went home, and then I was... Alone, as alone as you can be. And it's funny oh, yeah. because you came from a big family and your parents had really, looking back on it, with so many children, they would have really struggled to give you the best possible lifestyle. Oh, we had a great lifestyle. Are you kidding? We grew up, we grew up in a beautiful home. There was a Cadillac in the driveway, you know, so beautiful upbringing. And then all of a sudden there I was in this little tiny room with a, with a, with a bed as big as, you know, like, like that, tiny little bed and no bathroom. Yeah. The bathroom down the hall, dirty window with the dirty curtains, broken mirror, a sink. So I kind of went, okay. And, you know, every night I would cry myself to sleep. And then in the daytime, I would walk with my bass, which weighs more than me, to uh, Oxford Circus and go upstairs and write songs. None of them would have lasted five minutes. None of the rest of them. Not five minutes. So it wasn't, people always think it's a rock and roll lifestyle and off you go and you're having the glorious moment. It was miserable is the honest answer to start with, wasn't it? It's hard work and you have to be dedicated, determined and focused. And Mickey, as you said, um, uh, and always he even said to his wife, he didn't really know what to do with you. I think creatively, whilst you got on very well, and he was like your father figure in a way. He wasn't right to be the producer for you, was he? No, he never. I always say Mickey more knew what I wasn't than knowing what I was. Yeah. He knew I was different, you know, and he knew I was uh, androgynous. He said, you'll appeal right across the board. He said, gay, straight, girl, guy, you're going to appeal to everybody. Um, and he kept cutting tracks. I kept writing, but we were not we were not getting anywhere. It wasn't until I formed the band, the English band. I told me I was going nuts. I said, I need to play. And so I got a band together and he got us an agent. We did the Slade tour. We were doing um, all my original songs. And so after we came off the slate or the band was a unit and Mickey then had signed Chin and Chapman and he said, do you mind if they come along and hear what you do, get the feel of the band and maybe write you a hit single? And I said, not at all. I was still doing the majority of the writing anyway, so it didn't bother me. And they heard the stuff. I was very boogie. Do, 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 do. That's what I did. And so they uh, came up with Can the Can. And, and it was so quick. And, and what yeah. I love, you mentioned the Slade tour and, and Noddy, a uh, uh, great mate, uh, Noddy Holder, who, who turned on, he said you were one of the few bands because support bands for Slade, the Slade fans hated support acts. They did. They, did. they loved you. They did. <laughs> Again, there's that light shining. <laughs> yeah, they did. Oh, he's back. Okay. Uh, Rich, oh, Richard might even come in. <laughs> you never know. We might persuade him. He's not going to. Like he doesn't like it. Fun. He's not like, that's doesn't like it now. No, it's great. So, so anyway, you were introduced, and this was then the start of the magic. Can the can, 1973, all of a sudden projected, number one, you're glorious everywhere. How did that make you feel? It made me feel um, satisfied that my hard work had paid off and that I had gotten to where I wanted to go happy um you know i didn't get carried away with it because i was brought up in the business so it's 
you know, I didn't get into the business to be famous. I got into business to play music. So I was just happy, happy. My dream came true. Yeah. Proved and everybody. Was, I mean, and everywhere. I mean, well, Australia in particular and the UK, phenomenal. It worked on that sort of basis. In the US, we'll, we'll come on to in a bit. But the principle there was that also gave rise then to the change in your image. And as, as I understand it, Mickey, uh, you were very determined. You've always been very determined. Always get your way. Never let somebody take your soul. You were absolutely certain you wanted to have leather but it was Mickey as the sort of compromise, if you like, even though he didn't do well. We'll put it in that sort of hot pants thing. Is that the right story? No, he put his, I, I said leather, 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 leather. And he's, he's kept saying, no, we were discouraged. And I said, I, I have to wear leather. And he said, okay, okay, okay. And then he said, what about a jumpsuit? And I said, great. And the funniest part of that is me and my naivety. I just thought it was a sensible suggestion because I'm a very energetic performer and with the jumpsuit everything stays in one place. No idea it was going to be sexy. I had no idea which is probably why it was because you don't see me being sexy. I'm just that's kind of cute in a way. So when we got the pictures back from the first session and I saw me in the jumpsuit I kind of went oh oh dear <laughs> I better go to confession. <laughs> well, yes your mother would have found that extraordinary. What did she think? My mother, she did a great line. I, I took her to her, 74 this was, and we were playing Detroit. So my first time back with my English band, I have some hits. So, you know, the girl comes home successful. And I took my parents in a limousine to the gig, downtown Detroit. We were supported by Blue Oyster Cult and Kiss. I was a headliner. I know, that's glorious. Gene Simmons would have never, he loves it. It's kind Amazing. Of, support so us, support yeah, us. I know, it's great. So we were riding home in the limousine and I was in the back seat. my mom was in the front and I'll never forget it. I said, mom, how did you like the show? And she said, well, Susan, it was very nice, but do you have to stand with your legs so far apart? <laughs> She had some great lines. She was a one-off, I tell you. Uh, really I said, nice. Yes, I did, actually, Mum. yeah. <laughs> well, the, the other thing that happened as well, which was revolutionary at the time, was you and your star tattoo, which your father was not too happy about. I have, I have a butterfly on my ankle and a star here. I did this when I was quite young, before it became fashionable. Well, the, 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 star, the star was, when you were quite young, the butterfly was yeah. after your divorce, wasn't it? And you, you yes. wrote a song about The butterfly that. was from the divorce, but... Um, I had a tulip on my shoulder and a star here, both on it. So I think it must have been about 18, 19. And I'd come home from this trip where I'd had it done and I had on a t-shirt and I was washing my face. And my dad came up and he went, oh, get that silly decal off your shoulder. And he went like this, I'm washing my face going any second now, he's gonna realize. And he said, you didn't permanently disfigure yourself. I said, I did. Oh, he didn't like that. He didn't like it. It's, it, it was, uh, and it's always interesting, isn't it? Because th that's the other thing that people try and do. They always want the most important people are actually the ones who will keep you grounded. It's the family who keep you grounded. Because sure. all this adoration, I mean, you were, you've been performing, you say kiss for your support act. You, you work with the biggest and the best and the, you're doing huge places, Russia, you've got zillions of people there. I think you were breaking all sorts of records all over the place, weren't you? But the people who kept you grounded were your family feet on the ground at all times. I never got carried away with it, never. And I, I often talk about this. Um, I didn't grow up as uh, with looks in my arsenal. It just, just not part of me, you know? So now I can look back and see some pictures finally at the age of seven, you go, hey, that's not bad looking, but not in my arsenal. So what, what a, cause I was never told I look good. So how great is that? that I became a pinup for many, many men. And because it wasn't part of my arsenal, I never took it serious. Right. Can you imagine becoming that and, and knowing that you're great, that if you had that attitude? And, and it you, would turn you, your head, you turn your head. Often, Susie, don't you? And a lot of people who believe their own hype. Um, yeah, sometimes, oh, I can. And they, they get to the top. And very, very few. You're one of the one of the very, very few people who just managed to carry on for fifty plus years. So often people have their big moment and then disappear, and they burn out because they believe their own hype. You shouldn't do that. At the end of the day, I am 
my, my book is in two people, as you know, Little Susie from Detroit and Susie Quattro. Yeah. And I have the ego room. I know. I know. And a room. I, I love I, the ego room. It's brilliant. All the awards in there, including the red, red book. You can go in there and and then you come out and you shut the door. This is how I live my life. And you got to do that. I, but I love the sign. Not only do you say ego room, but you also say mind your head. Which I know. <laughs> it is good, isn't it? And you do go in there and you do, you do watch it and look and it's, it's, it's quite something. Yeah. And I have a big red book. This is your life. I think, God, it is. Every space is covered. And then you come out and you shut the door, you know, yeah. I mean, I'll take my applause. I'll take my compliments for the show, for the songs or whatever. And, but it's not that it's just, thank you. I'm humbled by it, you know? And, and, and that's what's so refreshing about it, because it's keeping it real. Because so many people, as you say, they have this veneer and you'll, you'll have this, uh, it's so often in, in, in the theatre, you'll have the, the tragedy and the comedy mask. And that's the reality of everybody. If you prick me, do I not bleed? If you tickle me, do I not laugh? You know, we're all the same underneath it. So understanding that is really, really important. And the other joy, apart from the music, was, I mean, you talked about 1977, um, an extraordinary year, apart from the loss of Elvis in that year as well. Happy Days, as you say, and it coincided. Tell us about that, because it wasn't, as you previously told me, there, there were three of you up for it. Uh, there was Debbie Harry. No, actually only two. Joan only two was of you, up. okay. Uh, but Debbie, and it just, it just wasn't her, you right. know. And then my publicist suggested me. Yes. And then they, and then the lady, the lady went home and saw my picture on the cover of Rolling Stone in her daughter's bedroom, because she had a big thing of all the covers, and she said, "That's that's that's who I want." And then they got a hold of me. Yeah, that that was a great decision I took. Uh, oh, what a what a role! Gary Marshall wasn't it? Because the way Gary tells it, it was his uh, his daughter had a poster of you in, in, a, in his bed, and he said. That's the that's the one who's going to play this that's glorious the role. Yeah. I love yeah. it. because Joan. I, I understand that Joan Jett's name was in the frame at some stage, and some people mentioned Debbie and things like that. But it was a. Uh, um, I don't think Joan's name was even in the frame yet. Um, she wouldn't have been even popular then. Right. She was just beginning in her band. But Debbie's was mentioned. Um, yeah, Joan's in my video. You know, in my do documentary, yeah. she sent me recently uh, a gold record of hers with my name on it. Oh, brilliant. I know we love all that sort of stuff. But Happy Days itself, what a glorious role. And I think, I mean, one of my favourite ones is when really when you're sort of out of character, if you were like when you're at Ralph Mouth going on that date with him when you yeah, come right. out as, as, as a different character, because you basically from going this wonderful leather clad leather all the way through. And it was that sort of prom night date, wasn't it? it yeah, it was. It was. An, and the director said to me, this particular episode is very important for you as an actress. He said, you're not singing, you're not being leather, and you have to really act. And I did a good job on that one, really good job. Yeah, that was really fun. I love acting anyway, but it was nice to st Here's a funny story about that. Um, there, there's a scene in that episode where I have to, I come to the Cunningham house and I walk in and I talk to Marion and tell her I need to become a lady. You know, and the original scene had me walking from the door to where Marion's mark was, to where she was standing, and I had dialogue coming along. So then when I got to her, it was, I need to become a woman. That's what I said. Um, and they said a little bit long this episode, we're cutting that bit of dialogue, open the door and get straight to Marion and say your line. So they took all my motivation away. So I had to do it in the walk. So I kept walking in, saying my line, walking in, and he said, it's not working. I said, wait a minute, give me one more shot at this. Knocked on the door. Then I walked a certain way, just a certain way. And then I got up to her and I went, I need to become a woman. The director said, perfect, what did you do? I said, I imitated Joan Jett imitating me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Brilliant. But I've seen her walk and I thought, that's what you think I walk like, so I did it, you know, like an exaggerate. And she, he said, perfect, because in that attitude walk, I was doing the dialogue without saying the dialogue. Right. I was doing the dialogue. Yes. Yeah, so that was good of me to think of that. That was brilliant. So was that one of your favorite episodes as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And, and it's fantastic. And working, working with Henry Winkler. I mean, he was, he's actually quite a serious guy, isn't he? Very serious. Uh, we're still good friends. I'm still 
in email contact with him all the time. And Ron Howard, Henry's a lovely guy. He's um, he's a sweetheart, but he's serious. He's serious. Ron is just lovable. Right. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. We do political emails all the time. What? <laughs> What do you think of this? I don't know. What do you think of this? <laughs> and it, it, well, I'll tell you what, this is the, the perfect time for doing political emails, isn't it? Oh, we did the, we did the whole Trump thing and then the Biden thing, you know, my God, I, I, I was sending him a sentence and he does, you know. <laughs> I, I do, I do think they miss, they've missed a trick with the Joe Biden during the campaign because in such, such a, a divided world when we're disagreeing on all sorts of things, Joe Biden, as you probably realize, is an anagram of be joined. Really? That's good. See, I would have used that for the campaign. See, see, it's good. You can suggest it to Ron next time you're doing it. Be joined, which should have been Joe Biden. The other thing which I quite liked as, as a campaign statement would be Biden by Don. <laughs> That's good. We love it. We love it. You've been trumped. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Top Trump. That's an instruction. Yeah. No, it's not. But no, be very you. careful. Okay. But you were offered then the success of Happy Days and great cast and all that sort of happy memories, as they say. Gary Marshall, as legend would have it, offered you um, a, a sequel, if you like, a spin off for your own. Is, is that right? They did. But I, like I see, you know, I don't like to be boxed in at all. I won't be. That's why I've done so many things. And I thought three seasons was enough to be La the Tuscadero. That was enough. And I was proved right because I went on to do a lot of other different roles. You know, I'm not known for just that at West End. And I've done Minder and Ab Fab. And he gets your, and he your gun. Fantastic. Oh, I loved that. Absolutely loved that. What a, what a honor. Even the songs, you know, when I was learning this score, I just going, wow, one good song after the other. Fantastic role to play. Loved it. So is, is it that diver? I mean, looking back, trying to dissect the real uh, Susie Quattro, is it, is it that diversity? Just one sec. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how much longer do you need? Because I got another one soon. Oh, okay. Well, we can. We can. Uh, how, how long? Five minutes. Is that good? Ten minutes. Ten minutes is fine. Ten minutes is fine. Be wonderful. Okay. We, we, we can always resume another day as well. It's always good stuff. We're, we're, we've only just done. We've only just done the seventies. We've got the rest. I know. Of the <laughs> Oh, I love it. But let me, I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. I mean, we will resume another day as well. But what, what I love is just getting, deconstructing Susie Quattro, having a look. It is that diversity, but it's also that honesty and the integrity. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. That is fair to say. And I'm, I take that as a great compliment. Um, the three words I use to describe myself are creative, communicator, and entertainer. And I'm always honest. I'm always honest. I, I, I just am. What's the point of not being honest? And, and I think you, you've seen all of that when, when you had the split, if you like, when um, uh, you had the difficulty with Mickey Mouse and Chapman and, and that sort of stuff, because you actually signed to Chapman for a little while. Yeah. And I know Mickey Mouse and your relationship with him was very, very close, but there was a period of time when you wouldn't talk. No, he was upset. He was very upset. But eventually we, he came here with his wife. They stayed overnight. And I sat at the table and I told him why I did what I did. And he got it. He said, okay. I said, Mike said he wasn't going to work with anybody other than people on his label. Come on, Mickey. He's my producer. And he writes the hits. So M Mickey got it. And, and we, were, we remained close and it was fine. But I was his little find, you know. He... That was not nice for him to lose me, but he didn't lose me. But it was like family because he discovered you and everything else. But as you say, he didn't really understand the real Susie Quattro. He didn't know what I was recording wise. He made one album with me, Agoraphobia, and he, he couldn't, Mickey never got my edge. Yeah. Mike Chapman got my edge. Yeah. Mike Chapman understood me in the studio. Yeah. Mickey understood me as a person. I mean, incredible. Three last things then in the, in the, 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 the nanoseconds divided us. A, a phenomenal career, o, over half a century, glorious stuff, diversity all the way through. I think we've unraveled a lot of the real Susie Quattro. I think there's a lot of synergy there, which we've known each other for a, li a little while looking at that sort of side. What has been your biggest regret? I only have one because I don't believe in regrets. I think they, everything happens for a reason. But when my mother was ready to go, and I'd been over maybe six or seven times, even flying there and then flying back for a gig. So I'd done my bit, but just as she got real close to the end, I said to Mickey, I, 
I don't know if I can see my mother this way and I should go because she's going to be dying soon. And Mickey said, don't go. And I said, why? And he said, because you can't take it. And so I didn't go. And I do regret that. And when Mickey was going to pass on, his daughter Natalie said to him, shouldn't we give Susie a round? And he said, no, she can't take it. So I, I wish I'd gone. I do. I wrote Mickey, Mickey a song called I Never Got to Say Goodbye. Beautiful song. But yeah, I, I think my mom, even though we talked on the phone, I think she would have liked it if I was there. She said she understood, but apparently she looked awful and I didn't want to see her that way. Do, do you, I would, was, was Mickey wrong? Do you think you could have taken it? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he's right. He knew me pretty good. Maybe that would have haunted me for the rest of my days. Maybe. Maybe. And what I, what I can remember is um, my last time I saw her alive, which was meant just for me, she was having the big football of cancer removed to make her more comfortable. And... Uh, Everybody, the whole family was there and they were, they were all crying and they were wheeling her into the operating theater. So she was, you know, on, on the thing like that. And um, everybody was crying and then the whole family moved off. And for some reason I hung back. So my mother was ready to be wheeled in and I was here. And just before they took her into the theater, her arms were shaking. And I thought, what's she doing? And she went like this to make her cheeks red. So she looked good for the doctor. I'm the only one that saw that. That was my parting picture of my mom. And what a nice ending picture to have of her doing. She was vain, you know, is it doing that? Oh, bless her. Yeah. So I wish I'd gone. Yeah, I, I get that. And your proudest moment? So many proud moments. What has been your proudest? God, so many. I guess when I was finally able to have a baby, I went through a lot. I didn't get pregnant easy. I had miscarriages, da, 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 da. And I finally managed to have a baby. You know, there I am, a bass playing rock and roll star, and I couldn't have a baby. I kept saying I'm a failure, you know. But yeah, I think that was pretty proud. I actually gave birth to a baby. Laura, 1982, followed by Richard in 1984. We almost saw him. Uh, and finally, then I'll let you, because you're doing a whole string of these, and we will get you back, because I love talking to you, and it's brilliant and so good. How, how would you, Susie Quattro, like to be remembered? with honesty and with affection and with integrity. That's how I like to be remembered. Come full, I'm full of compassion. I have all the time in the world for people in general. I, I love to, you know, if they need me, I'm there. I have so many people call me for advice. I give good advice. Um, yeah, honestly, I, I'd like to be remembered that I was honest. I was honest. That's the whole thing for me, the truth. Is there. Painful as it may be. <laughs> Warts and all, as you say. Uh, Susie, it's been an absolute pleasure seeing you again. Thank you so much for all your time. And thank you. I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So thank you again to my very special guest, Susie Quattro. Don't forget, The Devil in Me is available now, a brilliant track written from the heart. If you would like to be a guest or have any comments on any aspects of the show, write to me at guests at octopustv.com. That's guests at octopustv.com. Don't forget, you can follow me at Andrew Eborn at Octopus TV and subscribe on all the usual channels.